Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, leap year edition, 29th February, Forces Planning Board. I'm going to call the meeting to order, reconvened from February 15th. We have two me two members who will be joining us. They're tied up with personal issues, be a couple minutes late. Um, Mr. Simonis, Mr. Mahana, when they walk in, I may or may not introduce them, depending on what's happening with uh, public comment and so forth. <clears throat> so we have a public hearing on some proposed zoning amendments. And just as a quick clarification on what we're doing, these amendments, it's outlined in the staff memo, but these amendments started with the city council approximately two years ago in a general sense. And then last year it became more specific with a request of the land use committee, which was a committee made up of councilors and planning board members and some other people to look at a whole bunch of parcels, I think 70 plus parcels for possible rezoning. Um, with an eye towards additional housing is one thing, but there are several other um, goals that the Land Use Committee had that are all online. If you want to look on the city's website, look up Land Use Committee, you can see those there. But in the course of several months, last late summer, fall, the list was narrowed down to the parcels that we have to discuss again tonight. Um, and any amendment like this, they can come from different sources. They can come from the public in the form of a petition. They can come from the public as a suggestion. They can come from the planning board. They can come from the council. But they all end up back at the council, and that's where they're headed um, at some point. So to commence with the public hearing, as I said, this is a long list. I will read it, and then we can get started. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. I just want to let everyone know in, in advance that I'm going to have to recuse myself from one of the properties. Okay. A um, little background was that uh, in my course of my normal duties mm -hmm. at DOT, I had a meeting uh, with a project in Durham. And the developer happened to be the same developer who was interested in the property behind uh, Service Credit Union. Okay. So he said that he had already met with the city manager so that uh, I have that information and the rest of you folks don't. So I'm going to recuse. But the rest of the parcels, you're good to participate. Right, yep. Okay. So uh, the plan is to proceed. Um, did you want to make a presentation before the public hearing, or I, I forgot? Go ahead and go ahead and public read, read that, and then we can go back through it. Okay. But then I'll, I'll read what we're doing, and then uh, I may be getting ahead of myself. We may have staff report before public hearing, but we will be having a public hearing continuation here in a few minutes. So bear with me. We're going to, the proposal is to amend the zoning map to change zoning designation to Gateway Neighborhood or G1 uh, from Office Research as follows. Map 267 lots 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and map 252 lot 1, lot 1, 7, map 233 lot 145, map 234 lot 3, Lot 77, Lot 2, and from Garden Apartment Mobile Home, GAMH, Map 20, 291, Lot 11, and Map 285, Lot 1 from General Business, Map 234, Lot 76, 234, 5, 234, 6, 234, 51, Map 174, Lot 12, 174, Lot 13, 175, Lot 11, 175, Lot 4, 175, Lot 5. 236 lot 35, 236 lot 34, 236 lot 33, actually a portion of that. Map 236 lot 36, map 236 lot 39, map 237 lot 56, a portion of that as well. Map 237 lot 57 from SRB or single family, single residence B district, map 243 lot 66, map 228 lot 6, map 229 lot 6A, map 268 lot 97. And for mixed residential business, MRB, map 217, lot 1, a portion of that. Map 217, lot 2A, a portion of that as well. And from general residence A, map lot, map 174, lot 14. And from industrial I, map 273, lot 5. From industrial I and general residence A, or GRA, map 173, lot 9. In addition, then the zoning map to change the designation to Gateway Neighborhood Mixed Use Center G2 from single residence B, map 246, lot 1. 
Additionally, map, to amend the zoning map to change the zoning designation to Garden Apartment Mobile Home, or GAMH, from Gateway Neighborhood Business, or G1, and Office Research, Map 215, Lot 9. And as noted, these changes are proposed pursuant to the zoning ordinance. Um, Peter, did you want to? Sure, I'll say a few things. Um, and as we went through this last, or I guess on the 15th, um, this was brought to council at their January meeting. Um, originally, the land use committee had looked at, I think, close to 70 parcels and had narrowed these 40 parcels down. Uh, uh, they con con considered them the consensus parcels, the ones that they'd all agreed on moving forward. Um, and those were presented to the council at their January 16th meeting and then referred to the planning board for their consideration. Um, the staff memo has provided some additional background on how um, this is consistent with the master plan, um, specifically um, in the corridor areas. And I want to just going to show a map that was in the staff report that shows the corridor areas outlined in the master plan and where these parcels fall um, almost entirely within them. There are a couple that are just adjacent to the corridors that are outlined in the master plan. And the corridors are identified as existing commercial corridors that uh, the goal was to make these more mixed use districts. Um, and so th there's also a new table that outlines the property address and the current use as well as the acreage that's proposed to be rezoned. Um, if you want at this time, we did go through all the parcels last time. We can either go through them again or if the board wants to go through select parcels. Why don't we start at the north and work our way south. Um, one question that came up at the last preliminary part of this public hearing and discussion was whether or not there was conformance with the master plan or whether the master plan needed to be updated. I had forgotten that night. I had actually looked at that when the land use committee was doing this and then I re-looked at it after our last meeting. And this is consistent with and a continuation of the amendments that flow from the 2015 master plan. There was some conversation here last week with the um, Portsmouth Listens Group on the housing that brought up a number of zoning amendments, some of which are consistent with the existing master plan, some of which go beyond that and would require an update to the master plan. But in my opinion, all of these proposals tonight are consistent with the 2015 master plan. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I yes. if I could just follow up with that. <clears throat> um, the master plan was issued or finalized in February of 2017. Mm -hmm. And then shortly thereafter, I believe based on the master plan, <clears throat> 170 properties were rezoned G1 or G2 in response to that. So it's something to keep in mind as far as what the city's already done regarding the master plan. And uh, that's really been the only major effort on rezoning based on the 2017 master plan was that 170 property. We've tweaked it a little bit with heights and such, one or two properties here and there. But um, as we go through, <clears throat> something I'm going to be wondering is why weren't these 39 properties included back then? Yeah, I looked at that as well, and I think the from my quick reading of it, and I wasn't on the board then, and neither were you, um, I think what they did is they looked at the way the existing zoning, which was previously just gateway, it didn't have the gateway one, gateway two, and I think there was a gateway center district that's different than what we have now, and they basically changed many of those to conform with the recommended master plan changes creating <coughs> gateway districts the new gateway districts um, I think that's that's correct and even prior to that um, they were zoned general business and then in 2010 the old gateway district was created to just go into where those the boundaries of that general business district and then in 2017 the old gateway was converted to gateway one and gateway two <coughs> basically within the borders of those districts. It didn't expand it in any manner to other parcels. I mean, a lot of the, um, the older zoning is single, more single use and excludes residential. And I think that was one of the charges of the land use committee was to provide 
or find opportunities for residential, which may not be short-term opportunities. They may be long-term opportunities, but so, yes, that's uh, pretty consistent, I think, with what we've done. Yes, Jane. Um, I don't necessarily agree that this is consistent with that master plan, and so I prepared some talking points that I want to speak to. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that in this same agenda, we have um, an application for looking at waterfront properties and whether they should be rezoned um, because of the number of residences that are there. And the staff recommendations in that case is that we delay that until a master planning process. And I think I would also conclude that this would be better done instead of like a broad mapping exercise, that it be part of a master planning process. So I have other comments. Can I talk to those now? You can. We're going to have a board discussion after the public hearing. Do you want to wait to see what the public has sure, to say? Sure. I'll listen to the public. Um, yes, Andrew. Um, prior to the public hearing, it may be beneficial and constructive for us to discuss or you uh, to discuss or explain to the public how changing and amending some of these zoning areas uh, will contribute to the master plan and why it ties into the discussion last week with Portsmouth Lessons in respects to housing, uh, particularly because of just shifts in the economy or shifts in trends of development that we've seen. So maybe the public would be excited to hear about that and how um, these changes can, again, contribute to the next master plan dating back to 2015. Okay, that's, I think I'm inclined to hear what the public want, want, would like to say and then get into some of that. And it ties into what Jim was also mentioning a little while ago. And I, I'm sure Jane's comments, we can have a conversation back and forth about the master plan. And, and I look forward to that. But I think let's see what the public has to say. And uh, that's why you're the chair. <laughs> So anybody who would like to speak, um, we are going to follow the time limits. So anybody who wishes to speak in this first round, you have three minutes. Please give your name, address, and um, let us know how you feel about these proposed zoning amendments. This is not open mic night. If you want to speak about uh, the weather, that this is not your, not the venue to do that, but anything on the zoning, please proceed. I can think of nothing, Mr. Chairman, I'd rather not discuss than the weather. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all of you who are serving on the planning board, appreciate your public service, what you do for the community. My name is Tom Farini. I live at 69 Taft Road in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I am the chairman of the Portsmouth Housing Authority, and I serve on the Portsmouth Housing Limited Board. We believe the Portsmouth Housing Authority that these zoning uh, changes are crucial to the city of Portsmouth. And I, from my own perspective, I believe that it is in the economic best interest of the city to have housing opportunities in these districts. I think it is wisely considered and constructed as, as to what you have on the website and what you have out there. The reason I think it's important for our economic vitality is that if our businesses can't get employees, many of the businesses that we enjoy here, be they private sector for profits, be they nonprofits like 3S Art Space or the or the music hall, um, if people in those businesses can't hire people that live here, um, it's very difficult for them to create the environment that we consider so beneficial, both from a cultural perspective and certainly from a tax perspective, because for the straight ahead businesses that are not doing nonprofit or arts or entertainment, they need employees and they pay taxes and they own properties that pay taxes here. So I believe it serves all of our economic best interest to have housing on opportunities in these districts. An interesting thought, I've been in Portsmouth a while, and I noticed in 1980 we had 26,000 people. Um, interestingly, a number of them lived at Pease, but if you think about where these housing zones are now, where there's opportunities for housing, it wasn't contiguous to a lot of the other parts of the city. And there are some that might say, and it's a reasonable argument, and I frankly quietly said it myself, why don't other communities create more housing opportunities, and some do, 
But I really do not think, no disrespect to our neighbors, that many of our neighbors are concerned about the economic development of the businesses in Portsmouth and opportunities to live here. And I would rather leave that to us, the citizens of Portsmouth. It was a great city in 1980 with 26,000 people. We're 22 or 23,000 now. These are great opportunities for people to live. If Portsmouth Housing could do something for workforce housing in those areas, you've already seen what we know how to do. We've been doing it for 70 years and we'd like to continue. And I'd like to speak in favor of these amendments. Thank you for your hard, time, hard work, rather. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Margaret O'Brien. I am the principal broker of Bow Street Commercial. And I'm here to just um, say that I'm in favor of the uh, work that you've done. And I also just wanted to give you a commercial real estate perspective on some other properties to think about instead of just the corridors up and down the main highways. We have a big shift in office users and lack thereof. Companies are downsizing. After COVID, we're not seeing um, companies come back in the same uh, level. And all the companies are looking, employees want work, live, work, play opportunities. And so I'm just here to suggest that you might consider looking at the office parks that are dying, just like the malls are dying, and think about that as maybe the second round of other properties that you might consider um, changing to Gateway District. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mr. Chair and, and board members. My name is Chris Hilson, uh, 111 Maplewood. Uh, I'm an attorney at, at uh, Donahue, Tucker, and Chandela. I'm not here in my capacity as a, a business owner here, but rather on behalf of a number of different owners. Um, you, you don't have the map up. On the Commerce Way in Portsmouth Boulevard area, that is not one of the consensus lots that you're here to talk about uh, here tonight. But I'm here to, number one, um, articulate my client's full support of this measure. This is an important thing that you folks are doing. As you may know, my, my firm sponsors uh, communities and consequences, and the lack of workforce housing is, is, is going to choke us um, if we're not careful. Uh, and so this um, this effort is very necessary and m my clients fully support it. I'm here uh, to articulate or, or request that you consider either in connection with this proceeding or in the second tranche or second round to include those lots on Commerce Way and Portsmouth Boulevard in this gateway district. And there's a number of different reasons uh, for it. And Mr. Chair, if, I'm, if I approach my, my time limit, please let me know. You'll see a yellow light. Okay, thank you. It's like I'm at the Supreme Court. Uh, so, so, number one, and as uh, Ms. O'Brien just articulated, the market is changing. That Commerce uh, Way area is office buildings. And as an owner of an office building, I don't like to say this, but employers are moving away from that pure office uh, park model. And instead, they're going to mixed use. Their employees want somewhere to go and get lunch that they can walk to. Um, and they want to be able to live uh, close by that. And so what you're seeing with these pure office parks is you're seeing higher vacancy rates, and uh, it's, not, it's not looking great uh, for the office park moving forward uh, here in America, and certainly here in, in New England. And off of that, if you look at the configuration of these commerce you know, way properties, if you, if you rezone, uh, like the council is, is recommending, what you're creating is a pocket or an island of an office park that is surrounded by mixed use and, and really residential on, on that southeastern side. And the irony, because I'm a boring person and I think about stuff like this, the simplex case, the variance case, was right down the street uh, in, in, on Gosling Ave. And it creates that same scenario. You, you create, in that case, it was an industrial property surrounded by commercial. You're creating the same thing. You got an office park surrounded by mixed use. So rather than create that situation, because this is a valuable effort, you know, what, what my clients would suggest or request is either include those lots within this tranche or alternatively on the second time around, uh, include those lots within this uh, zoning effort. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. 
Next speaker. Petrie Hooter, 280 South Street. Um, I have more questions for you to think about um, than anything else. So I took what was in the packet. Thank you for the more information, staff. This was great. So I'm, I'm kind of struggling here to understand um, why we're looking at current, we've got uh, four car dealerships on here. We got two properties from churches. Uh, we've got five from hotels and we got a marine on here, medical buildings that are already in a current use that are not going to change. So my question is, on some of these, the, um, the size of the parcel um, is very small. I'm trying to understand what benefit 0.12 of a parcel of an acre is going to give you for housing. And I'm, I'm try also trying to understand um, exactly on the areas that you're looking at. I, I understand Lafayette Road and the Spalding. I'm still struggling on that with uh, car dealerships and the Marine over there that you're looking at. Um, the Rite Aid parcel, I really don't understand that, especially with the sides. Um, we have on this list, there's uh, basically 16 parcels that are over two acres, which is kind of small to build anything. And there's 10 parcels that are under one acre. So um, I hope you discuss this and think about what this is really trying to do here, because as far as I can see, I'm struggling to see how this is going to help any kind of housing going forward when the properties are currently being used for another use, and especially the car dealerships on sides. The other question I would have on this is uh, on the last list that was done, especially for um, when we were looking at uh, where to put the police station and where to put the, uh, well, it was the police station uh, to look at the Sherburn. Uh, the wetlands were included in, in all of that analysis, and there's no analysis here on the properties that you're looking at for how the wetlands are included in here. So um, personally, I'd like to see it a, a complete analysis done, including the wetlands, and I don't know if you've already um, looked at that, but it wasn't in the packet, so I'm assuming you didn't. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and Planning Board. My name is Mike Mulhern. I am uh, an employee, um, a member, and an owner of Service Credit Union, um, 3003 Lafayette Road in Portsmouth. Um, I commend you. Um, you are committed to your community. The more time I spend in front of planning boards, I just ins you inspire me. So um, I really appreciate your time. Um, our our commitment to the community is very similar to yours. Uh, Service Credit Union uh, commits to our membership, to our community. We uh, have made Portsmouth our international um, headquarters for the last 67 years. Um, we employ over 700 people throughout the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I can tell you that it is very, very difficult for them to find housing in Portsmouth. Many are commuting, commuting miles, hours uh, to get to work in, in Portsmouth. Um, and I'm afraid to say that a lot of people have declined um, our offers for employment because of the expense here at, uh, in Portsmouth for housing. So um, I really encourage you um, to think about um, and uh, to do the right thing for, for our uh, affordability. Um, the, um, the partials, we own a few of partials that are up for consideration uh, for rezoning. Um, some comments were made that um, our uh, uh, apartment slash mobile home um, uh, would take a, uh, it, we are currently zoned apartment and mobile home. Um, we are looking for increased density um, uh, beyond that so we could offer more affordable housing uh, to more people here in, in, in the seacoast. So um, again, I commend you for your commitment to the community. Ours is very, very similar. We've been residents here for 67 years. 
um, and um, we are finding it very, very difficult to employ, to employ uh, folks here in, in Portsmouth because of the expense of housing. So I, um, I encourage you to, to, um, to um, make the right decision for those people, those, those uh, uh, you know, middle, uh, low to middle um, that don't have voices. Um, I'm here to represent them. Um, we are committed to affordable housing. Um, and it isn't a 10% of development affordable housing. Um, we are very committed to, the, to this practice. So um, I, I appreciate your commitment, and um, I really encourage you to make the right decision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Rick Beck said 1395 Islington Street. I just wanted to come up and just say for front round one, I might take a little more than three minutes, so I don't want to try and speak once. So I'll reserve for the next round. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Patricia Martin. I live on Aldrich Road, um, and I recently uh, stepped down as executive director of a neighboring community. Um, in, in our housing um, climate in the seacoast. Um, I feel that this conversation, in, with my knowledge, has been going on since 2008. Uh, the Seacoast Housing Coalition came about in 2008. This is a housing crisis. It has been uh, talked about and talked about and talked about and talked about. It is time to do something. Um, I retired and I want to come back to do something in my own community. Um, I feel like people are still saying the same thing. So I, w I love what you're doing this evening. I encourage it. I think it's the beginning and it's a piece to the puzzle, but we need to keep going. And I think the, you have an amazing housing authority in Portsmouth. They do good work and you need to encourage and continue on this path and, and make it an emergency. It is a crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Pickett, and I am a resident at Osprey Landing in Portsmouth. And I am here to add to the sense of urgency that I would request the planning board grant whatever relief is available to you at this time instead of waiting for the next round of master plan planning. There are parcels that are up for discussion and there is an immediate need for affordable housing and developers and investors who want to make that happen. Um, I think that it is valuable to hear what is happening to the residents of Portsmouth. Uh, I today ran across a post from a woman who is in a mom's group, which is meant to be people talking about what ointment to put on a diaper rash and where to send their kids to preschool. But uh, I reached out and she gave me permission to share her comment. And she said, I've never been afraid of being homeless before. What happens when a family of five can't find housing, but they don't qualify for benefits because I make too much? Do we just live in my two cars? I have three under five years old, one a newborn. Like, what programs are out there for those who don't fall under the poverty line? Staying with family wouldn't be an option because everyone lives far away. I cannot leave my job. Our rent is increasing another $200, and now we can't make ends meet as it is. So when I spoke to her, she told me she's a teacher. She's working two jobs, sometimes 16 hours a day. Um, and then you move to the comments, and it's another mom who says, this just happened to me, and I am going to share with you the way that I found the cheapest hotels in Portsmouth to stay in while I was trying to get somewhere to live. After that, somebody commented, what about a campground? It's getting warm out. They're about 1000 a month. I know it's not cheap, but it's less expensive than rent. Two people suggested moving out of town. One said that she was already doing that. Somebody said, I'm having this same conversation in my home. There are others, suggestions for hotels and Airbnbs. And my point here is that this is a crisis. We've asked a 
again, with a sense of urgency that the planning board do something to meet this need. I don't feel like it can wait. I feel like every day I am hearing stories of people who have to move out of Portsmouth and leave their jobs that they're working, leave their friends, their community. Um, I'm in a similar position. I just took a job with the Housing Authority, a, a promotion um, that is going to mean that I lose my Section 8 voucher. And I've depended on that for the past seven years as a Portsmouth resident here. And now, because I have succeeded in my career, I'm looking at, well, what is my next step? Um, so I respect the time limit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. First of all, um, I respect everything that Andrea says and I agree with it as a, someone that works in a public school. However, I would ask you to really think of the master plan. Um, one of the reasons we're in this crisis is there was numerous units that were put in um, housing for affordable housing, housing and means, um, and have come off the rolls. They've done their 20 years or 30 years in one case, which now makes them open for full market value. There's quite a few units that we've lost to full market value. By just going ahead and making the gateway zoning, I was part of the zoning. I was part of the original gateway and not putting parameters in that zoning is not going to support our community in 20 years. It might support today, but it won't support in 20 years. The other thing that I'm a little disillusioned about is that have we let the neighborhoods know that this is going to butt up against Echo F, Elwyn Park. I was here when then Mayor Farini spoke with a whole group of people about not putting a brewery across from his neighborhood, which is now the Army Nas or National Guard. Do people know? In a town I was just visiting, whenever there's zoning changes, they put signs up in the areas and on the parcels, they're going to be changed so people can give input. You know, I'm hearing about let's solve the housing problem. I totally agree. As a business owner, bring the people in. But the problem is we cannot do it at the level, financial level, that we're currently going for rentals. We need to really be thoughtful and, th and think through what does that look like and what better way to do it than in zoning and really talk about what and how we're going to keep this zone that is financially acceptable to people that are making minimum wage. Lastly, in my last 26 seconds here, I would ask those people that have already had discussions with developers about this zoning, maybe you want to think about stepping down on those projects like Mr. Hewitt did. I would encourage you to put this as part of the new master plan and really put it into effect because what people did 20 years ago is no longer in effect and has gone to market value. Thank you. Thank you. Next first round speaker. Good evening, Elizabeth Bradder, property owner 159 McDonough Street. I'm not going to speak now. I'm just going to pass out my papers. I was kind of hoping that um, the slides would be shown to assist people as they're looking at what these different things are, because um, I identified everything by the slides. But hopefully it will be able, helpful. So I'm going to pass these out, and I will speak at the next time because I'm over three and a half minutes. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Uh, next first round speaker, I think I, I think Liz, you said you were going to wait for the next round. Good evening, Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. I have to say that I, I fully understand what you're doing with the rezoning of these properties to include them in Gateway for residential. I get that. My concern is actually with the fact that somewhere along the line, the new budget has just allayed $150,000 and kicked it down the road till next year. Now here you have a nice gentleman from DTC Lawyers who's begging you to add a trench of property on Commercial Avenue and property that belongs to his other people that are employing him. And we aren't talking about that. The fact is what concerns me tonight is the reality, as Andrea Pickett was talking about, that we aren't addressing the real problem in the room, and that's that we can't build housing that's cheap enough for people to actually afford it. Those people that need the affordable housing don't need an apartment with two bedrooms that costs them $2,800 a month. They can't afford it, $3,200 a month. They need real housing. They need housing they can afford so that they can legitimately house their families in it. Now, I think I applaud you all for, for trying to rezone these properties, but what happened to the master plan along the way? Do we simply think we can do it in-house? That $150,000 that has now been kicked down the road for a year that's coming up before the council added to your money, your $400,000 that you were thinking about for your master plan. Well, newsflash, it's not just your master plan. It's the master plan that belongs to everyone in this community. Those people who are the 1% and those people who desperately need housing. And I bet they'd like to have a conversation as to how that's all going to work. But I'll save the rest of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other first round speakers? Here we have some on Zoom. If you're on Zoom and would like to speak, please raise your hand. OK, they're on Zoom watching, not, not wanting to speak. No other first round speakers? I'm going to open up the second round of speakers. Now you have five minutes. Good evening again. Rick Beckstead, 1395 Islington Street. I'm in the construction business. You know what things cost. Not sure if we can go and build this, but I came down tonight just for a couple of reasons. One being uh, Craig Welch last year. I mean, everyone keeps talking. We're just going to keep building more housing. We're never going to build ourselves out of this crisis, ever. The market rate is the market rate. The land prices are the land prices. Our budget is what our budget is, and it's going to continue. It's going to continue to thrive when people want to come here. So I've always made the argument that we need to protect what we have existing. Um, I've got a couple of ideas. I've shared them with some. I've expressed my ideas for 10 years. But I came down tonight basically to give a little history lesson on the Spalding Turnpike and what New Hampshire DOT has gone had the, the city of Portsmouth go and do. So as we began the discussions probably four or five years ago, really in depth with the state of New Hampshire, we were able to go and possibly be able to get into sound barrier walls on a secondary measure. The municipality puts up percentage of the money, New Hampshire DOT. Well, they finally realized and got a lump sum of money thanks to COVID um, to be able to go and allow those sound barriers to be put in place. But the city was asked to do a complete sound study on every nook and cranny around the city. And the last place you're going to want to build housing is along the highways. Because New Hampshire DOT has that documented now, we've signed off as a city that is implemented that there is no housing in these locations. And I'm speaking specifically on the Spalding. 
New Hampshire DOT will not, under any circumstances, allow an exit or an entrance onto the Spalding Turnpike from there. So we've had two projects that came forward. One of them was a Subaru dealership, which ended up taking to court. I think they ended up going to Superior Court and they lost. Uh, there was another housing proposal that was done there. And again, the same thing. It would impact a neighborhood, a large neighborhood, a large neighborhood of, of the uh, Ward th uh, 2 and 3 combination. I think actually it's 3 and 1. Uh, I'm talking directly about Woodbury Avenue. So <clears throat> the implementation would be is, is all that traffic would be going in out of Echo Ave. Now, Echo fought really hard. I was one of actually the proponents before I was even on the council to go and actually have DOT, which still remains as a temporary closure, to be able to go and not allow any cars there. What you're talking about there as far as with the Mazda dealership and the, uh, they were actually the Frank Jones pine trees that actually give some buffer zones to the rest of the neighborhood that's there, um, a chance. Um, you're going to be implementing a neighborhood uh, that is going to be drastically affected. You're going to be going against what New Hampshire DOT said. We're not going to be doing any sound barriers. You're going to create that whole persona once again of what we've heard for 40 years that run along the 95 corridor. So I would respectfully make a recommendation that you would recommend to the city council that that portion of the Spalding Turnpike not be done away and rezoned. It should stay as far as with the commercial. No housing should be on there. There are places that are suitable for housing and places that aren't. Now, one of the speakers had actually gone and talked about uh, how we had gone and lost housing. They were talking about Ledgewood. Ledgewood was a government funded, and I believe it was about a 30-year 30 30 year policy. And just a few years ago, we actually lost that status, so it no longer needed to be held to that standard and was put on to market rate. That's the one that we went and we lost. And we lose a lot of things when it comes to things. I'm still to this day going to be very proud that we went and advocated for the city of Portsmouth to go and buy community campus. Now, some people go and say, well, we just took on a huge debt and we took on responsibility. But what people don't realize is what we would have lost, which is why I said exactly to the city manager. There are over 300 kids that are in a daycare facility. So we talk about housing crisis. We talk about food. We talk about daycare. 300 children have lost their daycare. Where are those kids going to go? It's one of the reasons why I went and put the plan in place and pushed and worked with the city council and the city manager to go and actually purchase that property to protect and to gain some land. We might not be able to build on some of it. We do have four acres that are up front. I still, in my mind, in my opinion, we should be doing some kind of housing there because there is no impact to any neighborhood whatsoever. And it has all the utilities that we need. It has our water, it has our sewer, it has our roads, our exits in and out. It does not impact the neighborhood at all. And it's four acres. You probably could go and put somewhere between a four and six story building there with no adverse effects other than probably wouldn't want to be there in the summertime around water country when they're open full bore. So there's a reason why some of these places have been developed. Some of them haven't. I mean, you guys are going to do what you're going to do. City Council is going to do what they're going to do as far as Lafayette and everything else. And congestion is going to build, so on and so forth. But cannot build affordability. The only way we can do that is to be able to do exemptions. And the only way that we've been able to do that and why it was so successful for Portsmouth Housing Authority was because we had help from the federal government. And when I was mayor, I advocated with that. But we've given a little, little, bit, little bit too much money out when it comes to COVID. And we don't have that money coming in from the government to be able to subsidy. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other second round speakers? Good evening, Elizabeth Bradder, property owner 115 on McDonough Street. Um, I'm just going to go through the slides. If um, Peter Stiff wants to bring them up, he can. If not, you guys are going to have to work from memory. So the first one is Oriental Gardens. It was recommended to be GAMH. I would, I would propose that would be true. The second slide is the Rite Aid property. It's abutted by SRB and MRB, and I personally believe it should be MRB. The nearest G1 to that is across the street, the Market Basket property. And if you think about it, that's six lanes of traffic as well as sidewalks. That's a good distance away. Everything else around there is MRB and SRB. Therefore, I would suggest MRB, which is mixed use residential, which allows for residential and small business. It's not that big of a lot, and it literally is right next to three houses and a playing field. The Spalding Turnpike has exactly the problem that Rick talked about in terms of noise. But if you were going to do it, I would suggest that you do G2. It's a, lesser, it's a little bit lesser use than, than general business, but it does allow some um, 
residential, but you need to think about what intensity you're going to put there because it directly abuts SRB as well as wetlands. Slide four is the Best Western and the Holiday Inn, which directly abuts a GRA neighborhood right there in um, Christian Shores. Um, G2 would be the most I would suggest for that area, but I would caution you to think about this. That on-ramp or off-ramp, whatever you want to call it there, from the traffic circle is really very, very difficult to get on and off of. And if you start putting residential housing right there, you could have a traffic mess. So you might want to just leave it as it is. So you have to really think about what would be the impact of putting residential where those two hotels are. The same thing with the Portsmouth Chevrolet lot, which is slide five. Do you really want to put residential right on the traffic circle? You've got thousands of cars going by there every day. Just the fumes alone might be a little bit disgusting since they sit there for long periods of time. Um, if you think that's okay, I would say go with G1. And those three smaller lots on the bottom there, I would say do those as G2. Slide number six is Borthwick Ave. It is currently OR, which does not allow any residential, but it requires 30% of open space as opposed to G1 or G2, which can be 10 or 20%. This area is one of the last areas where there's trees in Portsmouth. If you drive down Borthwick Ave, it's, the beginning is really kind of nice before you get up to the hospital. And if you look to the left, there's all those beautiful wetlands. I would recommend you don't change the zoning there and if someone wants to put residential in there, they'll have to meet the requirements of OR. They can still get a variance to put residential in there, but they would have to keep that open space and protect those wetlands. Slide number seven, please. So this one I thought was interesting that it's even on the list. Actually, there's two of them. One piece is the bottom left down there, and that's actually abuts the back side of Chase Home property. Chase Home property goes from Lafayette Road to Middle Road. And there's that little corner spot that's SRB now that you guys want to change or somebody wants to change. It shouldn't be changed. It should stay the same because that lot, if it ever got sold, if Chase Home ever got sold, could absorb that other lot and it could become one big SRB, which could be a big residential area. So that lot by, Ch by Chase Home, I think, should stay SRB, as you notice, there's another SRB or municipal lot right next to it. The same thing with the one, so if you're driving down Lafayette Road and you take a, I mean, sorry, it's Route 1. If you're driving down Route 1 and you take a right onto Lafayette Road and you pass the golf restaurant, I mean the golf, yeah, the golf restaurant, which was the Tuscan Kitchen, which was a lot of other things, it pretty much changes to residential there. So why would we want to push the G1 into that area? Right there by the high school, you want to keep that residential. They're just put new two, two new houses in there. So I personally think that should stay SRB as well as the, the property by Chase Home. The Christ Episcopal Church, which is slide eight, I would strongly recommend you leave it at SRB at the most GRC. You can still build houses on there, but there, it's surrounded by the Urban Forestry Center, which the city of Portsmouth is very lucky to have. It provides a massive amount, tremendous amount of education component. It's a great place to go, to walk, to relax. You get to see the wetlands. Why would you want to change that to a G1 or a G2? That piece of property could be absorbed if it ever got sold by the state. Now slide nine, which is across from Elwyn Park. Oh, I'm running out of time, sorry. So Elwyn Park, I thought would be G2 just to protect Elwyn Park. And the industrial, further down on slide 10, I would leave as industrial because industrial is very specific to itself. If we don't have industrial, you have no place for people to get things. That's wholesalers. All of the little businesses get their doors there, their windows there, their siding there because they have places for big stuff. That's it. You can look at the rest of my list. Thank you. Thank you. Any other round two speakers? No other round two speakers? Anybody on Zoom? Hmm. If there are no other round two speakers, I'm going to close the public hearing. Last call. Anybody on Zoom? One last time. Raise your hand if you're on Zoom, if you wish to speak. 
Nobody here wishes to speak. We'll close the public hearing. We have board discussion. Jane, you had things you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I, um, I've thought about this and almost nothing else since last week, and so I started making notes for myself. So um, this is about a page and three quarters, and I decided to hand it out to the rest of the planning board so that you can follow along with my comments. It was never really meant to be, it's not a report or anything, it's just literally my notes. Um, and I want to really thank the public who came here tonight and advocated for what you really believe in terms of housing for all and I believe quality housing for all. Um, I don't, I think the vision is shared um, and my concern here is that we're doing a mapping exercise and that this approach is actually not the approach that's really going to get us the kind of housing that we want for all. Not just workforce housing, but housing for low income, housing for middle income, housing for the elderly aging in place, housing for small families, new families moving into town for everyone. Um, and on the basis of that, I, I agree with the macro goal as I see it, um, that the land use committee, I guess, was created by the city council to quote, look at diversifying land use regulations. And these particular zoning considerations that we're looking at tonight are to quote, create more opportunities for housing development. There's no way to be against that goal. I mean, of course, we all, uh, I, there's not gonna be anybody who doesn't agree with trying to create more available housing and mixes of housing. But I don't agree that this is the way forward for a couple of reasons, and let me outline it. Um, first of all, I, I don't see how the proposal, which is to basically rezone everything, 38, 39 parcels of land to G1, how does that achieve either diversification of land use regulations or how does it actually re relate to creating more opportunities for housing development in and of itself? I don't see that. Um, there's more buildings. I mean, perhaps more buildings will come in. I don't know that we can control that they don't also go to market rate, as Rick was saying, um, but more buildings does not equal the growth of more neighborhoods. And when I look in depth at our own master plan where it's already spelled out, when I listen to Portsmouth Listens reports to us, I keep hearing about neighborhoods, not just having a mash of buildings. And I hear about a real concern for the impact of buildings on neighboring neighborhoods, that there be a cohesiveness, that there be an integration that this takes planning and that it, it include connectivity and that it be scalable. The in, increased scale of more buildings without consideration for impact on neighborhoods, that's what I see when I just see completely rezoning as a mapping exercise. And a note about these expanding corridors. I don't think we should be expanding corridors. It's one thing to be changing to G1 or considering changing to G1 what's already listed in our master plan as our corridors. And let me quote that those are currently Route 1 Lafayette Road, Route 1 Bypass, Woodbury Avenue to the Market Street Extension, and that those together already comprise, according to the master plan, 38% of Portsmouth land. So. I do not think that we should be do, doing rezoning to actually start expanding our corridors into Borthwick Avenue, into Greenleaf Avenue is on one of these maps. I, I am not for that at all. I don't see how that serves the neighborhoods that are already in existence um, and the use of land the way that it already is in those two areas in particular. So. What we all, I think, really want to do is create more diverse housing stock in specific ways that create neighborhoods. 
The master plan on page 44 states goal 1.2, to encourage walkable mixed use development along existing commercial corridors. And I have to laugh, because the other day I was at the intersection of Morona, that, that traffic light where there's McDonald's and Morona Road and, and Lafayette Road, and a woman was trying to cross the street there. And I can tell you, that was not pedestrian friendly. That was not walkable. She couldn't get to anywhere from trying to cross the street. And she was crossing Morona, not trying to cross Lafayette. So I don't think the city has achieved this, which is already stated in our master plan. It also says, development provisions should be refined to stimulate the redevelopment of corridor areas into walk walkable mixed use centers, including additional needed housing. My question is, of, co my course, of course we all want that. How much housing do we need? I gotta tell you that I am a lousy planning board member who was asked over and over and who has not got the data to do anything like evidence-based planning here. I cannot tell you how much workforce we have, how much workforce housing we need, how many low-income startup couples or young families there are, what kind of mix of number of housing units we actually need, what the demand is. That's lousy. That is needed for planning, no matter what we're planning. I mean, if you were planning like building a garage, you would decide on how big does it need to be, what capacity am I trying to create here, and then you'd work on what resources do you need, et cetera. To measure progress, the city should track the construction of new pedestrian facilities such as sidewalks and improved street crossings and new housing units within commercial quarters. That's from the current master plan. We've not been doing that, or I don't know that we've been doing that, and if we have been doing that, none of that data has been shared with planning board members. Um, I was very happy to receive the reports from Portsmouth Listens last week. From one of those reports, they also emphasized that they wanted equity throughout the community with as much focus on neighborhoods as downtown. There's been a real imbalance, and that's what I hear when I go grocery shopping and people come up to me. Why are we doing a master plan for the downtown, they want to know. Why are we pouring resources into the downtown? What about our neighborhoods? What about all the people, all the taxpayers who are not in that, I don't know, one square mile of downtown? And I can never really answer that. So they too are talking, Portsmouth Listens is also talking about a vision of neighborhoods. A slide was actually presented, I didn't get all the notes from it, of what makes a great neighborhood by Portsmouth Listens. I know it had 15 minute walking distance from everything that's needed, like all your services, connectivity, a sense of integration with other neighborhoods, that's what I'm hearing as a vision from people when we get to hear from the people. So I don't agree with this approach. I don't think a mapping exercise takes into consideration architectural design standards so that we don't lose the sense of that we're in Portsmouth and not a suburb of Boston. And I, I think that that can happen with quality and low income housing. I think that we can demand architectural design standards and we haven't done that. I think there needs to be better incentives for affordable housing and depends on what we're really talking about here because everybody's using the term affordable housing when actually there's a New Hampshire definition of affordable housing. But I think when people are generally talking about it, they're talking about affordable for all socioeconomic <laughs> strata in the city. And that's acceptable too, as far as I'm concerned. But then let's think about some exceptions regarding taxes. We're upping the budget in this city. We have a $137 million budget. I don't know if we're upping the census. It feels like we are, but I don't know the data for that. So 
yes i think we could have some incentives and some exceptions if we really care about workforce housing and affordable housing the way that new hampshire defines it and new hampshire defines it as housing rental or owner occupied that costs no more than 30 percent of one's gross income and those rental costs include rent and utilities ownership is the monthly principal on a mortgage interest taxes and insurance I, I think we can take a look at that kind of tax relief or incentives at least to help start up families rather than mapping we need to rezone corridors not expand them in an orderly manner <coughs> guided by clear principles and i'm missing those in this discussion and data which i'm thoroughly missing with public input in a transparent process that ensures that we don't negatively impact already established neighborhoods um, i think we also need to include requirements for building out complete streets also echoed in the master plan and ensuring open spaces. All of these things make for quality of life for everyone in the city. We need to consider that the current zoning of much of Route 1 as G1 in 2010 was meant to, quote, encourage mixed use districts with human scale design and amenities for bikers and walkers. But by 2016, we only had one mixed use project so it's not enough i don't think it's enough to just go and rezone like this it doesn't end up with whatever part of this is a shared vision of all the taxpayers of portsmouth why didn't that happen that's what we need to look at what else do we need to change other than just rezoning to make this a reality to move from corridors as a vision to maybe gateway plan development with actual agreed upon standards. And I do think, I mean, I understand the urgency of housing, but I also do think that we need to take enough of a moment here to try to do it right, to do it right on behalf of those people who need housing as well and not relegate them to corridors of wasteland. So as a planning board, I would approach this really differently. I believe in an evidence-based approach that better defines the specific scope of the problem. How much housing of what type is needed? And, and what mix is responsive to the actual needs of current taxpayers? You know, that's not, <coughs> that's not something that I need to climb a mountain and ask the Buddha. I mean, this exists somewhere. And it should be a rapid fire data gathering experiment. The number of workers requiring the number of affordable housing units, we need that. Also on page 15 of our current master plan, it says that we've already reached our regional commitment for affordable housing. If that is true in 2017, then again, I, I personally am not sure about how to take the term affordable housing the way that it is used by anyone and everyone. Are we talking about that New Hampshire definition or are we just saying affordability in general is eroding as market prices are driven up? I can, I can understand that, but please note that it looks like we've reached our regional commitment on the definition, the formal definition of New Hampshire affordable housing. If that's not true, I'd love the data also. Very open to that. I want to see that we build neighborhoods that are walkable to services, connected, and have character. That character-based zoning isn't just something for downtown. Portsmouth Listens participants also stated they wanted, quote, unique neighborhoods that are as special as downtown. And the master plan on page 125 envisioned this <laughs> as, quote, expanded neighborhood development with meaningful connectedness along corridors and gateways neighborhoods should include some services places to gather to eat to socialize and places for special events they should include complete streets with people and trees 
green street strategies of streetscape design in any new construction. So work on pedestrian accessibility. We don't have pedestrian accessibility up and down Route 1. That's what I, I sat at the traffic light and noticed with this woman trying to even cross Morona Road. Um, but that's because, as I understand it, it's, it's up to the city to really work out with New Hampshire DOT. We've had many years to do this. And in other places, like Rick said, particularly the Spalding Turnpike, I see, I see no outcome with just changing it to G1. Okay, let's change it on a map. Now what? Who would you want to live there, even if we could have ingress and egress from buildings stacked along Spalding Turnpike? Because unlike further north on Route 16, and this irks me every time I go to Dover, unlike that area of Route 16 where we have sound barriers protecting neighborhoods on both sides straight through for miles and miles and miles, in Portsmouth we're not able to finesse that with the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. I cannot understand well why, but I would not allow buildings to go up there without sound barriers. Just because you're a lower income citizen of Portsmouth doesn't mean that you should live with like unlivable sound quality. We need vibrant mixed use centers. We need to think about our zoning in, in that sense. We need open spaces, art spaces. A lot of our master plan talks about living in working spaces for artists also, and some of these corridor areas were envisioned as that. And they need to be compatible with existing neighborhoods. Okay, I only have three more points. So the Portsmouth reports, the Portsmouth Listens reports, uh, according, also stated that according to the Portsmouth Housing Market Study projections of 2020-2030, um, it showed a need to increase, they, they actually put numbers on it, which I very much appreciate and I want to echo here. They indicated a need to increase owner units by 227 units and renter units by 2,897 units. I'm not exactly sure what the timeline is. I, I, I really agree with those from Portsmouth Listens who kept calling for not a big hefty master plan report perhaps, but an actionable plan with timelines and deadlines for all of us to meet. Um, but how do we do this if we don't have an inventory of what we have now and what we've actually already approved that hasn't been built yet but that we know is coming, how do we do this? How do we know if or when we even achieve this? So I want an action plan, a master plan, whatever you want to call it, that's measurable, that's got measurable indicators. We know when we got there. We know how much of the problem we solved because we have evidence about the depth and demand of the current problem. And we have a timeline to get this thing done that delineates specific unit targets by housing type. It's not outside of our reach. I would also work, I, this, I'm still talking about the approach as a planning board that I would take to doing this. I would work with city departments to determine infrastructure capacity and transportation needs because transportation is, seems to be a real challenge slash barrier to actually developing out some of these neighborhoods or mixed use centers. Um, as well as talking to police and fire about what kind of growth is doable and can be supported <clears throat> by our city's infrastructure. And the, finally, the planning board might have to rework incentives or exceptions for larger scale housing so that we know however much workforce housing is really needed, that we're well on our way to meeting that demand. So on the basis of all of that and disagreeing with the approach here, I, I, I've gone around and around about what to do. I mean, should we consider this rezoning in segments? I see that Elizabeth is trying to do just that, and 
I very much appreciate it. Um, should we be tabling this until a full approach with the kinds of data up front and outcomes and rationale for the outcomes we're trying to achieve in each one of these 39 parcels is clear to everyone. Um, in the end, where I stand, being a member of the master planning subcommittee that was convened in June of this year and is still waiting for staff to review our last draft RFP or RFQ to get consultants on board to get this master planning process going, um, I'm at a loss. I don't want to delay it further. I think shunting it to this master planning process that does not seem to have city backing, city support, is going to send it to the Netherlands. What we will we'll never really see it, and that's not what I'm about, and that's not what this planning board is about. So I think that we should more seriously and specifically consider this as a planning board. I think that for each one of these parcels, we need to hear what the rationale is for that parcel and how it's going to result in the goal, which is further housing development and further mixes of types of housing development. Otherwise, I vote no on this because I do not understand how it leads us to that conclusion. Thank you. Okay, you raised a whole bunch of questions and point, raised some points you thought you mentioned you didn't understand. But before getting into those, I think the other board members might have things they might want to say. I will just say at this point, this is a zoning exercise that we're talking about here. And some of the things we've talked about in addition to zoning are changes to the site plan review regulations, which that's how you get some of the details that we're talking about. Gateway zoning creates the opportunity to create mixed-use neighborhoods that doesn't exist with much of the other zoning. But the actual physical layout and how that design fits, that's a site plan issue for the most part. It can be partly subdivision, but it's mostly site plan. It's not zoning. Zoning can provide some parameters, and we could add uh, character district zoning. That's a type of zoning. It's more specific. But I think I hate to use the word crisis. I think that's the wrong word. It creates um, wrong legal connotations since there's an attorney in the room, more than one attorney in the room. Um, but there's certainly a concern, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed. And the market is changing. One of the things we've noticed that uh, since the master plan was completed, and that's why we look at these things, things have been changing due to COVID and other things. So it isn't, it isn't this or nothing necessarily. We do need to look at, we've talked about looking at site plan regulations. We've talked about adding um, architectural design guidelines outside the historic district. We haven't done it, but we've talked about it. And I think we can continue, we should continue to talk about it. That's how we create the mixed-use neighborhoods. But you can't do it if the base zoning doesn't allow you to do it. And to say, just get a variance, that's not the way you do planning. That's not the way zoning works. Because if you need a variance to do something you want to do, the zoning doesn't fit. So that's enough for me right now. Yes? Just a, a quick reminder, as, as I've done many times in the past, I'd, I just want to plug the city's website for information. The, uh, on the city's website in the planning department um, tab in the planning and sustainability, there are several um, reports, just as a reminder for anyone that wants to look at. They're very interesting. Um, Housing-related reports and data. Um, Portsmouth Market Study done by Portsmouth Housing Authority in 2022. Portsmouth Housing Development Trends. Portsmouth Listens Housing Dialogue Phase 1 Reports. Housing Committee Final Report to Council. The list goes on and on. And then New Hampshire and Region uh, documents. I don't hear so I was, um, I looked at a lot of these today. The list is very long, but um, they speak directly to a lot of the questions that were just asked about um, the, the existing housing stock, how much of it falls within categories, um, with projections on how much is needed. Um, again, just a reminder that we, we, 
I, I always like to remind people it's easy for it's easy to forget a lot of this information is at our fingertips we just have to remember to go look at it um, I'd encourage everyone to look at it it's good stuff thank you <clears throat> Andrew yeah I think we have a great uh, sampling of the public here tonight and we saw or heard two very different dichotomies of opinions and those were raised and, and immediately acknowledged from the other members of the public, which really helps because outside of considering individual proposals and projects on a monthly basis here, the planning board's purpose is to get into a dialogue with all members of the public, uh, from developers to individual citizens to property owners, and hear uh, what their ideas are or how to improve our city. And so to have representation from certain developers, from PHA, and then individual property owners, I think allows us to engage in a better dialogue and more constructive dialogue in turn to create a more constructive master plan. Now, last week we had a extensive presentation from Portsmouth Listens, but some of the more resonating statistics there were um, we have 1% available land to build on in the city, and uh, that got me thinking about some of our existing landscape. And um, one of the other acknowledgments from last week was that our community is extremely tenured. Uh, a lot of the people who spoke and folks who spoke, it, it was almost comical. They were like, yeah, I, I'm a newer resident of the city. I've only been here 12 years. And I, I was like, you know, that's quite a bit of time. And then the average time was 20, 30, 40 years or 50 years or longer. And to me, those people have such a depth of history about really the iterations of uh, development that the city has seen. Um, and so where that got me thinking was, how can we take some of these properties that will inevitably turn over, whether that be to people moving out, retiring, death, divorce, distress, what have you? That's the nature of real estate. So how can we take those properties that turn over and create units from within those properties, right? So to give you an example, uh, some months ago, we saw a proposal from 132 Middle Street which is actually two separate buildings. And um, that building was built in 1810. It was built as uh, a, a gift to a ship's captain's daughters. So there were only two units in that, that two, whole structure. Now there are 21. So that has since created 19 additional units. Granted, it was built in 1810. Why can we not look within our existing landscape, existing neighborhoods, to create some of these additional units? Other multifamily buildings in Portsmouth um, you know, they have the quirkiest apartments, but they work. And that's why people move here, is because they like that uh, aspect of the character. And, you know, I, I work in the real estate brokerage world, and my first job out of college was doing the leasing for the Viridian Apartments on Constitution Avenue next to McKinnon's. Um, the first day I showed up to that project, it was about 60% done. And people looked at me with their heads turned sideways, and people would stop me in the grocery store and all over the place and say, why are they building that style building? And now we've since learned that there has to be an adaptation period. And um, I'm sure from 1810 until today, that 132 Middle Street was also looked at as a peculiar build. However, we have to adjust to what the market is asking us for. Now, can we allow or enable, I think is a great opportunity word there, can we enable some of these existing neighborhoods to create more units within it? Um, I played sports all my life, and when you're losing in a game, your coach says, we have to score one goal at a time. And so I think if we can enable some of these properties to create one, two, or three units within the existing building without creating any new construction whatsoever, how can we create units that way? And all, also, what that does is acknowledge the fact that the people that own these properties own that at a significantly lower basis than new developers are buying at, right? So if I go buy a piece of property and want to build um, X amount of units on Durgan Lane, um, my basis is inherently going to be extremely high. Now, if I own a property on Wybird Street, Lincoln Avenue, and I bought that building 25 years ago, and I'm going to spend some equity to create two more units in there, that's a very different equation. And that allows a property owner to rent those units at a significantly lower cost, and their market rate is significantly different than new construction. So that is how my mind works. And I think for us to not have to build anything necessarily, but just create from within is, is really where this opportunity exists. Now we started that with the ADU amendments uh, about a year ago. And 
you know, there were some limited uh, statistics on that because we have had so few ADUs permitted or at least actually constructed based on the permitting. Um, to me, we have to have these, these quantifiable metrics in the master plan as Jane so uh, adequately observed. So again, in my mind, how do we derive an ROI from the suggestions of these concepts or the suggestions of these zoning amendments? And how do we derive an ROI, so to speak, into our master plan? Um, that's how a business mind looks at it. And, and I know that some of these community members may look at it differently, but that dialogue is how we will get there. And how we get there from today is starting one at a time, uh, one at a time looking at, is this a corridor problem or is this a property problem or is this a dialogue problem? And I think to have the opportunity to proactively discuss it with either a developer or a property owner is really the, the golden opportunity because most cities just get a proposal on their desk and react. Um, the proactivity is what we need to focus on, uh, whether that be data orientation proactivity or project base. So um, that's, that's where my head's at. And, and the last thing, just as an outside comment, um, the United Way of the Greater Sea Coast is located in Pease, and they have a program that uh, gives property owners that have multifamily buildings, excuse me, up to uh, $850 per unit per year to improve and meet the threshold of quality for their low income housing units. And I think if we use that concept, so United Way, obviously a, a national organization, if we use that concept on a more local level, whether that be at say New Hampshire or city of Portsmouth, um, how can we incentivize property owners to use a certain threshold of quality while still maintaining a certain uh, economic practicality for their rental units? Um, and so that thought of, okay, if we contribute money or incentivize, <laughs> how can we balance that out um, to attract and, and again, enable property owners to do these units and create these units uh, for, for some of those lower income households that we need to uh, uh, um, uh, appease to. Thank you. Councilor Morrell. Um, I'd just like to state that I, I feel that the changes that were made were in line with many of the policies of this and plans of this city. The master plan being one, the housing policy being one. We had market studies both done in Portsmouth by PHA, plus our regional RPC has done a regional housing assessment, and so did the state. And all three of those assessments give us tons of data and tons of numbers that support the plan of trying to create the opportunity for more housing. Just because we change a zoning doesn't mean that housing's going to come. It means that there's an opportunity to create these. You talked about the Viridian. I remember that wasn't allowed in the zoning when I think it was first proposed. And now they're going to be building another building which is gonna give us 20% workforce housing for sale. And that's the first time that's happened in the city from a private developer. So that's really cool, right? This gateway zoning is actually starting to create some of that. I find that exciting. I find it exciting that other people are talking about adding some housing to you know, these business slots and it's going to create more housing. And by expanding the gateway zoning, it fits in with all of the planning and all of the talk. And when I sat and listened to Portsmouth Listens last Thursday, I heard a loud cry for, we've done a lot of planning, we've done a lot of talking, and it's time to actually act. Well, this is a step in the direction of actually taking action. And I think that is the direction that we need to go. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just go back to the 2017 master plan. That, you know, it was approved in February 2017 in February and 10 months later we created 170 new properties with gateway one or two and I think that's how appropriate you know if we had a master plan it identified problems and we changed the zoning but let's look at what happened in the corridors in those in the last seven years as far as housing goes we have Juniper Place 50 units $700,000 condos. Bartlett Green, 18 units, 600,000 condos. Cinemagic, 90 units, 20% um, will be at 100% AMI, the rest market rate. The Viridian, 90 units, 
market rate apartments, 140 Lafayette Road behind five guys, 53 units, market rate, WHEB, 72 units, market rate, West End Yards, 250 units, uh, should have been 20 percent uh, workforce, only 10 percent, and they're at 80 percent AMI. Middle Hill Condos, 30 units on the bypass, all market rate. The Westerly, 48 units, $700,000 each. So I, I listened to Andrea Pickett. I heard her. I heard her loud and clear. Will changing these gateways help her and her friends out at all? Are we just going to recreate the eight projects I just listed? That's my issue. Well, I think the, it, as Councilor Moreau said, it's about creating opportunities. And you know, the more opportunities, there's more opportunity to diversify the to the market. Well, you know, and after seven years, excuse me, we had plenty of opportunity, and my those eight or nine projects, nothing well, happened. Uh, I'm not going to argue. I just there, there may there may have been plenty of opportunity. There may not have been enough opportunity, but I don't see the problem with creating additional opportunity, Mr. Mahana. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Um, I see this as optics. It's it's taking a red brush and going like this up Route One. It's not going to accomplish anything. None of these are vacant. So, well, very few are. We could go through these one by one, and there's a couple I would say that I'd, I'd be in favor of a zoning change. But the vast majority of them, absolutely, absolutely not. And why would we even look at properties that are mostly unbuildable and wet and change the zoning? I mean, this is just a broad brush for optics. It's not going to solve any problems, and I won't vote for it. Thank you. Andrew. I, I just have a clarifying point. Andrew, the microphone. A clarifying point, um, and someone had mentioned it last week as well. Uh, again, we've done a lot of plans and reports and, and studied quite a bit, um, and now we have the city council, uh, as, and by proxy, Beth Moreau, um, suggesting, yeah, we just need to take some action. Uh, the gentleman last week said, we've gotten to the line, we need to take some action. And I'm absolutely in favor of that. We need to take the action, right? Um, but I think what I am hoping to clarify is if we take this action and change these zoning uh, amendments, does that get us closer to the opportunity or does it just enable somebody else to do something very similar to what just Jim had listed out? So I, I don't know. And I, I'm not taking a stance one way or another quite yet, but I don't know if there's a way to clarify how the city council had thought of it previously and and how we can learn and adapt again from previous plans and reports um currently rkg is actually working on and they've uh, a consultant that the city's hired to take a look at all of our um, incentives for workforce housing and the actual numbers around that so that we can as possible next step um and i'm sure the housing committee will be all over this when it starts meeting next week um, that we can actually start to look at what makes sense from a actual financial point of view as far as the numbers of what we can ask for for workforce housing and what will then get us more workforce housing. So that's like step two is to actually take a look at all of the incentives that we have around that and make sure that the numbers that we're putting into our zoning actually make financial sense. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, that is my biggest point of clarification is do we want to open the gate to these opportunities before having those digits and figures and math figured out? I think it's been going on simultaneously, so I think it'll all happen pretty darn closely together because mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have those soon and we can take a look at those and that continues the conversation. I mean, these changes don't happen just because we vote on this today. It still has to go through three readings in city council. Sure, and as a lot of us have already mentioned, it's probably going to be a master plan effort as well, and it's not going to die with that final reading at the city council. So I get that as well. It's, it's certainly a longer term initiative. It's a chicken or the egg thing. And to me, do we put these opportunities out there for developers to t tag the low hanging fruit at market rate, or do we construct some sort of um, equation and then put it out there and then be willing to 
adapt and, and change. So if we take that action and we step over that line, that's really exciting, first of all. Second of all, we have to be willing to amend thereafter, as we've done with other zoning amendments. We have to be willing to change again and again and again because we have to learn in real time. And I, I, I just don't know which one comes first, honestly. I think we were facing a, um, a bit of a dilemma on what to do first, as you just pointed out. And uh, I'm also hearing from the input from the public tonight and from what the board has been talking about that we're prob we probably need to have a regular discussion about needed zoning amendments, additional properties to mm -hmm. come in, and perhaps some tuning of what the G1 district permits. I think step one is something to consider would be a map change as we talked about. I don't think it's not inconsistent. I don't see it as inconsistent with the existing um, master plan that we have. The reality, and by the way, just so it's absolutely clear to everybody here and listening, the three-person subcommittee of the master plan, which is Mr. Simonas, Jane Pagal, and myself, we've talked extensively about the need to have much more robust public input than has ever happened before with the master plan in the city of Portsmouth. Mr. Simonis and I have met with the high school principal. I met with the superintendent. We're talking about starting at that level and going all the way through all age groups and all people around the, you know. Uh, the folks who show up at these meetings typically aren't that, uh, there's not that many people. So there are probably other people we need to reach out to in different ways, and that's one of the reasons we'll be having a consultant working on this master plan who knows more about this than we do in terms of how to do that outreach. That's going to inform the master plan process. The reality is we're not going to see a new master plan in 2024. I hope we see one in 2025. But meanwhile, that's at least a year out. And we have zoning that doesn't permit housing. We're looking at several parcels that don't permit housing at all. Now, there are other things you can do here, but I see it as not necessarily letting the horse out of the barn, but creating an opportunity for the horse to go out and eat some grass. You know, it's uh, we've we've got zoning that doesn't fit current conditions. I think it's it's outdated zoning. It's single use zoning, and I'm all for the idea of expanding it into some of the adjacent neighborhoods. The idea of creating uh, the orphan parcel is the term you use in zoning when you surround something by something you shouldn't. That's that's a good point, duly noted earlier in the meeting. So that's that's something else we can talk about. Um, I'm not sure if debate is going to get us much further. I think folks almost, I mean, there are, to me, extremely obvious parcels, but I think I'm guessing what's the point. I think folks' minds are made up. I think we're ready for a motion and see what happens. I'll make a motion that we vote to recommend to City Council the map amendments as follows, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, and 1.3 is in the memo. A second. Any further discussion? Um, I understand the reluctance of and, and the questioning of individual lots and whether they be wetlands or so forth. I'm not seeing any harm that we might be doing by advancing this forward for discussion. Um, clearly, there is a huge amount of energy behind this topic in the community and nationwide. It's, it's, not, um, it's not just us. Um, I'd hate to think that this board in any way was, was seen as something that was in the way of a solution. And I think this is a very, um, um, by supporting further discussion of it, um, doesn't, you know, we're not, making an actual change tonight. We're pushing things forward for discussion. We're basically recommending discussion on these, um, as far as I can tell. Um, and if there's something that is found to be wrong with any of these decisions, there's still time to correct it. Um, I believe there's an urgency to it. Um, I, I don't believe that it's 100% understood by any one person in this community, but clearly it's a it's a it's a major issue, and I'd I'd hate for the planning board itself to be in the way for any advancement of the of the discussion or 
um, the advancement of potential solutions. Uh, Greg, then Jim. Just for clarity, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. 1 1.1 1 .1 just removes a lot because it's municipally owned. 1.2 just adds some more lots for discussion to our big proposal. And lot one point and number one point three is just clerical. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So we're not rezoning anything with those. We're cleaning up the map, correct? No, we recommend the amendments we recommend what was presented with these amendments to it. Oh. So you. those oh. would those would be mapped Thank you for that. Doesn't right. say that. Yeah. That's not what is one that, point one point three. The, the list that came from council in January, um, there were in one point two. Those lots were originally considered by the land use committee, but weren't on the list. They're small parcels, and and then one point three corrects um, a couple maps that were on that list, but corrects them with the correct parcel numbers. Right. And then as one point one is municipally owned, that was recommended to leave. As municipal. So, so we're not changing 39 lots. We're changing about six. It, it would it would be the group of lots included with these changes. He's, he's, he's actually group. he's actually as, reading the planning department recommendation. Exactly. Thank you. If you could pull that up just for clarity. It's as presented with the amendments of those three. The motion, just to clarify, the motion is to make all the changes that I read, the 40 or odd, odd parcels, with these amendments. That's Thanks. what's on, that's what's, that's what the motion in second is for. <laughs> that's not what that says. The, what you read is the, amend, the amendments. It should, it's planning department recommendations that say city council map amendments with the following amendments. Please. So it's all, it's all of the things I read earlier. Yep. Everybody clear on that? Yes, Jane. So when I look at all of these different parcels, <clears throat> there's maybe about six of them that I agree that it would be you know, go ahead, change it to, to G1. With others, I have a huge hesitation because there's all, already an existing for years and years, if not decades, businesses that it, it doesn't do anything. It, do, it doesn't absolutely do anything. And I disagree with others, such as having housing along Spalding Turnpike under any condition. I, I just think it's inhuman. So I, how do you vote? How does one vote when, no, I don't agree with the entire list, but no, I'm not saying no as an obstacle to progress in the city of Portsmouth, I kind of really resent that as a, you know, like, oh, if you, if you vote no to this, it means, you know, you're really actually not pro finding different houses, housing mixes, you're not taking advantage of the full potential, when in actuality, I agree with some of a subset of it, but not others for very specific reasons. So can we do a vote where we can give recommendations as to why our no's are no's, for instance, or? Uh, to, well, to answer your first question, the motion that's presently on the board is for the entirety. Okay. If that doesn't pass, then another motion could be proposed. Okay. Just to, one of the points you raised earlier with respect to sound barriers, and it was raised by one of the members of the public, mm. we do have a sound overlay I know. district and yep. if if housing were proposed and that's just one of the many things that can happen in a g1 district they'd have to conform with the sound protection provisions of that of the overlay and okay. we just saw that you you know what that is mm -hmm. um, so it's not it, it's not I don't think it's the same type of concern it would be in other locations that don't have that provision in their zoning uh, one thing zoning can be a long term and it does create an opportunity which we've talked about earlier tonight. The fact that there's an existing business there is of interest, but it's not controlling. When the zoning changes, different things, different opportunities are presented. So the existing owner or potential new owner might want to consider some other use for that property, which could include an apartment above a commercial use under but, the G1 zoning. 
But these changes include changes for existing businesses that would actually put them as in non-conformance with the zoning that we're changing it to. That seems very strange to me that we would take a, a, a business and or an office research, the OR along Borthwick, but we'd actually make them non-conform because we're hoping that we could in the future when the hospital's not there or the parking lots that are endless aren't there or the office buildings aren't there, that maybe we could have housing? Mixed use, I think, is the goal, which includes housing. Paul, you know, turn it up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I, I feel fortunate to have been able to hear so many voices on this and the information that's been provided to me to, to consider these uh, um, uh, amendments to the zoning. And it gave me an opportunity, too, to, to study the, the master plan as a, as a new board member. And I, I find this to be consistent with the, the themes and the goals within the corridors in the master plan. Um, I also see this as an opportunity for me to do something now. Um, there can be a lot of discussion and a lot of granular dissecting of these different properties and parcels. Um, and that sort of gridlock, I think, is our greatest opportunity to, to break free from. Um, I've also heard, you know, people talk about, uh, that, you know, there's a car dealership that may not go anywhere. If you've been other parts of the country, Florida, Texas, California, car dealers and commercial and retail go to the latest, newest hotspot and they abandon the old zone. And all of a sudden that changes to something else. You know, it might get depressed and it might be used cars, you know, but then it becomes something new is born out of it. But they're not they're not stuck where they are. They will they will go and it could be it could be the Fox Run Mall already looks like a car dealership when I walk through it. That whole thing could become car world over there and they all flee to it. And you have, you know, empty, empty property. So I can't envision what somebody would do in lots 236, 237, those ones along Spalding. That's the one I struggle with the most. But I hope somebody surprises me with something in there. And, you know, it would have to be subject to sound studies and, and all of the other things. There's, there's a lot of work that would happen at a lot of levels before anyone took up residency mm. in a property along the Spalding Turnpike. Yes, and Jim. You know, I, I think we were all here a week ago during the Portsmouth Listens housing um, presentation, and how could you not listen to all those presentations? I think it's groups A through M or N, and uh, I try, I'm try. i trying to understand or, or think of how this zoning change is going to accomplish any of those goals that we heard a week ago. Um, I, I just, we have seven years of history with G1 and G2 from 2017 till now. And I, I listed the projects that were built. Not one of those projects is remotely near what we heard a week ago. So in my mind, we have seven years of history of G1 and G2, not a single project that met the criteria of a week ago. So that's where my mind's at. Just starts the clock for those properties that were changing. The chair. Sorry. Speak to the chair. Reminding Mr. Simone. Yes. Uh, my clarifying point earlier was really because as soon as we say, yeah, let's push these properties forward, and then the city council goes through their process, and then assuming they approve it, it just starts the clock because it's going to perk the ears of developers to walk in the door and hand us a proposal that may or may not, depending on their ambition, 
uh, align with our master plan goals without having amended these zoning ordinances. Now, without amending anything or changing our affordable housing policies or things of that nature, we will get the same development that we have seen. It is nearly guaranteed, um, just judging by supply and demand of Portsmouth. So it just starts the clock. And I'm not opposed to changing parcels to then take action, uh, but we have to be more swift or more diligent in getting our affordable housing metrics and goals achieved because if not, we will just get the same developments that we've already got. So it may be that what is needed in addition to this is some additional regulations, the site plan that I talked about earlier. But don't forget, some of these parcels are in locations, as Paul just said, he can't imagine residential. Jane said she can't imagine residential in some of these parcels. Well, you know what that means to me? It could be an affordable location for small residential units, rental units. And if they are properly soundproofed, they're not going to be, you know, impossible places to live. So that could be a different market than what has happened in the last seven years because of location. You know, that's a key component. You know that better than I do. That's your business. Sure. So there are places that are being proposed for rezoning. And this isn't a, a one and done issue. This is something that the council, I think the council is ready to act on this. I'd like to support that action, speaking personally. And I would like to say, let's not stop. Let's keep going with what we've been talking about tonight and propose some additional additions to this and maybe some other things to work on. Yeah. I'm ready to do that. Yes, Joe. Uh, very well said, Chairman. If this were a one and done, I would not be supporting the motion. I wouldn't. Um, because for all of the things um, and all the questions that have been asked tonight, all, of the, all of those reasons, um, uh, just a, a, a little um, history on, I'm a, I'm a small time landlord in the city and when new development and new units get built, and I've spoken to other landlords that have been landlords for a long time and with these small historic buildings and houses throughout downtown, it drives our prices down when new, when new housing comes in. Um, it's not a great model, but I can tell you it truly does. When, whether it's, uh, all housing is good housing. If you go to any housing coalition, workforce housing coalition meetings, they, all housing has an effect on, on the issue. Um, you know, it's a, it's a supply and demand issue. Um, so without speaking too much about that, because I'm not an authority on it, I can tell you that um, the encouragement of more housing will, will work in a positive way for, um, for this problem. Um, and I do hope we have more opportunity to refine and, um, and refine the subtle language that speaks to um, all of the questions that you know we all have but I don't want us to par be paralyzed for the sake of perfection at this moment it's not perfect it's not perfect a few things are yes Greg. not to be argumentative but I'll counter that I've been a landlord for 30 years when new construction comes in it brings people to the neighborhood and they look at the $2,500 apartment and say, I can't afford that, it's brand new, which brings, brings them to my apartment, which used to be 1500 it's now 2000 So it doesn't lower anything. It actually raises it because it brings folks to the neighborhood, and I've seen it in every town on the seacoast from Exeter to Rochester for 30 years. Okay, well, let's, let's, so take, let's take... Rezoning this isn't going to create affordable housing, period, because every one of these parcels, except the two or three vacant ones, are going to require significant infrastructure to tear down what's there and, and build what's required so it's not going to create little micro units like down at Stady. <clears throat> it will create the opportunities for more housing. What that does to the market, I guess, remains to be seen. Um, any other? We do a roll call vote. I think we need a roll call vote. Yeah. Sure. Can we clarify what we're voting on, please? We're voting on all of the proposed map amendments that I read at the beginning of the meeting, which is everything, with the amendments in the planning department recommendation, the corrections are basically what they are. So a, a favorable vote, or a yes vote, rather, is recommending it to the city council? Yes. The recommendation to council to do that. Thank you. Everybody understand that? Mr. Salinas? Yes. Ms. Begala? No. Mr. Giuliano? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Mr. Hewitt? No. 
Mr. Omina? Yes. Vice Chair Mahona? No. City Manager? Yes. And Chair? Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> Six to three. Thank you, everybody, and let's work. Let's work on the next steps together. Let's keep going on this. Excuse me. When you say "let's," like "let us," who do you mean? The planning board. You mean the planning board, because now there's a city council housing committee. There's a land use committee. Sometimes I actually really get. I there feel is like, no land use committee. What'd you say? There is no land use committee anymore. It's sunset. Well. The Land Use Committee developed this recommendation, right? Correct. From so last year. until like one second ago, there was a Land Use Committee, right? No, it's, it stopped last year. Okay. But I'd like a clarification about the Planning Board's role in actually achieving what we all really want here, which is looking for a mixture of housing that includes affordable to all socioeconomic strata in Portsmouth. How do we do that? I'd like a discussion about that. I don't want to just say let's do it because I don't think what just passed does it at all. So what what should we do to get there? As I explained at the beginning of the meeting, for zoning amendments to happen, they can happen a number of ways. One of those is at this board. We don't have to have any other input from the council. We've gotten input from the public this evening. We've gotten input from each other. Um, I think that we can proceed on that basis to work on this as we talk. That's what I meant. So that's what we can do, and I'd like to move on with the agenda, honestly. Um, we have a request. Mr. Chair, excuse me, just one last minor thing on zoning. Um, during this whole process, I've noticed that the, uh, the zoning map on the city's website is phenomenally hard to read. It's like our whole city crunched down on, a, on 11, 8 and a half by 11, and it's so small, you have a bunch of colors and no streets. So could I request the planning department make five zoning maps based on our wards and then post them on the website so they're blown up, so they're much easier to read? The map that's on the Mr. website is like a 33 by 44. Well, it it's still, it, again, if you look at it on a screen, it's, it's minuscule. So if that was broken up into the five wards, with the zoning on those five wards, I think it'd be much easier to read. The colors are hard to follow. So is that, is that possible? I think as a part of what we're talking about, that helps with clarification. Because the other thing I heard last week was people don't understand zoning. And that's actually a problem if people don't understand zoning. Um, I believe the next item on our agenda. Sorry, but is can this happen? That, well, is that a yes or a no? That was a yes part of what we're talking about. I don't, all by itself, I don't think staff can just go out and do it. It's a fair bit of work. But as a part of what we're talking about, that's part of what we're talking about. Oh, I, I, didn't, clear, I didn't realize zone. it was such a difficult I task. can easily do that. You can also look on Map Geo. That has the zoning layer. Right, where you can but tune I'm, in I'm talking about the average yeah, person. If it's that easy, if it's that easy. Yep, I can do just it. Just take the five ward okay. maps. It's done. It okay, yes. great. It's done. So will that be done by next by the March meeting? Sure. Okay. Thank you. We have a request to rezone Salter Street from Waterfront Business to General Residence B from the City Council. Uh, there's a background letter. This came up earlier. If you want to bring up that map, Peter. And to a point made earlier, um, to me, this is a correction. And I think that the particular area, it makes sense to make a recommendation now. I think the when we get the map up on the screen, the area from the end of Salter Street south So this area is what the request was for, but the current zoning also extends south. And north. There you go. All of those properties. I think there's, th this area is more complex, and it, just speaking personally, uh, that area makes sense to me to consider as a part of the master plan, but this 
make sense to me to consider changing to residential <coughs> because right now that waterfront district doesn't allow residential. So that's my input on that one. Yes. I, I guess my feedback on this would be to follow what the other properties have done, which is one property deep off the waterfront and then the rest becomes part of the residential district that it abuts to you. But just because that follows within line with all of the lots, both south and north in that area. So would you extend it farther south or would you, I'm sure how to. No, I, I exactly. I would take just the end lot. Top <laughs> I would take just the very end. Oh, you, oh, you moved it. Yep. You moved it on me. Right. Yeah. So I would take. Where does it go? This very end lot only to leave it, and then I would take <coughs> these rest of these lots, and make them residential. Because if you look south, they have that split down here. It's residential, and then it's waterfront, and that's how all of the ones adjacent to it are. So I would just make it a little bit conforming to the ones near it in my mind. Chair, That's my only suggestion. Yes. Um, I tend to agree with half of uh, Councillor Moreau's uh, comments, but the waterfront goes around the corner. Uh, so I would stick with waterfront being waterfront business because we just had the Portsmouth 400 anniversary. Working waterfront is very crucial to the history of Portsmouth. Working waterfront just to the south is a very commercial lobster mm -hmm. pound, just to the north is a commercial marina and if somebody bought that one out at the end of Salter Street and wanted to put a Portsmouth water taxi on that dock or some other minor commercial it should be allowed because we're a working waterfront and I would keep it the way it is working waterfront all of it all five lots because the waterfront goes around the corner all of those you notice all those properties on the other side, not the one at the end, all have docks. And in fact, you know, being at Esther's Marina to go kayaking, you look across there and the first parcel, number 13, has got an extensive dock that they could do something like um, Shoals Fishing Charters, you know, six pack license out of there. They could also do ports with water taxi since they've been shut out of Prescott Park. There's a lot of, there's a lot of waterfront businesses that would be applicable there. And I'm not talking about a lobster pound. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. I mean, Esther's Marina has a gift shop as well as a kayak rental as well as, as slips for rent. And it's literally 150 feet across from that. And it's the identical parcel that goes around the corner. So I'm done. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good points. Andrew. Uh, hopefully a really quick point. Yeah, I think if I recall correctly, the gentleman on the end uh, some years ago wanted to permit a, a residential unit in that outbuilding um, on the end. Yep. And the, either the city of New Hampshire or the city said no to that. No, um, it's there. Oh, it is. They had to move it back. Move it back. Yeah. I see. Okay, thank you for that. What, I do what? know that that's condos otherwise. Um, so that in my head is harder to transition to anything but re residential condos. Now, to Greg's point, yeah, definitely. You know, having a dock is a huge amenity to a waterfront business. Um, if that house abutting uh, on the corner of Marcy and Salter decided that they wanted to sell and, you know, a commercial business person wanted to buy that and create some variety of business there. Do I see that as an opportunity? Yes. Uh, less so on the interior parcels as that would be a huge parking and traffic nightmare for everyone on Salter Street. So uh, I I'm pretty neutral, uh, I suppose, but given the fact that they have been existing as residences for a long, long time, and the fact that they're in the HCC and there are some condos in there, I, I do feel like residential is probably more aligned. Yes, Paul. I, I, I really tend to agree with that, but I'm also looking at this, and I, I, I believe waterfront business is the smallest land use that we have in the city. Like there are just these few parcels right mm -hmm. along there that are zoned that way, and they are in the historic district. There's there's some out on Sagamore Creek. Mm -hmm. Just just a just a few, yeah. with very small amount of uses, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, does that mean that they're insignificant, or does that mean that they should stay as those last remaining few opportunities for waterfront business? Like who knows? Someday, 
that that whole thing could be a business, some some destination sort of thing. Okay. Just, just to state, I, I, I'm in agreement with the position the vice chair laid out. I think it makes great sense to, to leave it myself. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Just it, it, yeah. sorry. In the event of a sale, you know, that's a, it's a very exposed part of the water line there. And if there's an opportunity to bolster that shoreline right on that part, I, I would have a feeling that waterfront business may take more of an initiative to protect their property, right? So if they're a waterfront business and they rely on that water access, they're going to do everything they can to create sustainability in that waterfront. Um, and that's not to say that the residential wouldn't. Uh, I think that a lot of those folks probably are doing that now to pr protect their property value just innately. So um, yeah, you know, I, I, I guess, why is there a detriment to leaving it? No, I'm, I'm hearing consensus to leave it. Just like one or two little sentences to follow on what Andrew just said. It's very interesting because I'm involved in a marina. The state of Maine has legislation pending that the marine, Maine Marine Trade Association is, is uh, pushing through and it's likely to pass that commercial working waterfronts allowed to raise their bulkheads and their structures two feet automatically because of the storms of last year and the year before. So again, at the marina, we're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars raising raising our seawall and our bulkheads because it protects yeah. our business. Where a re Andrew started this, and he made an excellent point, and I was just following up that this is what's happening in Maine already, right now. All great points. Would somebody like to make a motion to leave it the way it is? We'll look at it during the master plan process. Second. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good Thank you. Did everybody have a chance to look at the EV amendment proposal? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I had one little recommendation for the EV amendments. Um, we're using the language of a level three chargers, and uh, Department of Transportation uses DC fast charge. Does level four, five, you know, flux capacitor could be down the path <laughs> and so forth. Can I just clarify, so, that, that document where you're looking at the level one and level three, that was what was originally referred to by the city council in May of 2022. Um, and so the, the other document that was sent out um, was the document that the chair and the staff had been working on. So that's the um, red line. Which doesn't have, which doesn't uh, describe it by level three or anything because of the technological change advances that DC, might be obsolete. DC in fast six charge. Months. Yeah. Yep. It's it's actually since since our last meeting, there's now level four. <laughs> mm. yeah. By the time we get to the parking lot, there'll probably be level five. Mm. So DC fast charge. The only thing we know seems to well, be the even, language that DOT uses. We and just said commercial, yeah. so. We kept level one and two because that's household, and but said said it's household, whatever typical households. So if houses use something different, right now it's called level one two, and so that's in the language. But if houses end up using something, you know whatever the heck it is. Uh, my recommendation was just to be in alignment with what DOT uses level one we agree. two and we agree. faster. Yeah, we agree. Um, I make a motion that we schedule for public hearing in March. At our March meeting, do we have to send to legal first? They would like to look at it just to, before. Can they look at? They it? can look at it and then in your packet we'll have their. Okay, so viewed. we can do it for March. Um, do you have enough time to notice it? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Any other discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. <clears throat> So the only other business, I think, is uh, what we talked about. So if folks want to have, should we talk about having a regular workshop to talk about zoning? Should we plan on doing that every month? Does that make sense to folks? I mean, we've had a lot of meetings lately. Um, I forget somebody mentioned it, but I'd just like to try to reinforce this. So LUC is gone. Um, I think the way that this 39 or whatever 
parcels was, I'll use a word that I can't come up with anything more eloquent, eloquent but it was shoved down our throat. I'd appreciate not that being done with whatever the newest committee is that's working allegedly for us to bring stuff to us as recommendations. Um, we should have been warned about those 39 parcels. We should have had access. I don't have time to go at 9 o'clock on a Friday or Monday whenever land used to, I used to go, but I can't. The background is all we needed, and we didn't get it. And if we had the background, we would have probably been a lot more productive and voted on it two weeks ago. So whatever they're going to dream up for housing, I'd like to be uh, informed along the way before they send us a 50-page document for approval. approval. Okay. It's uh, just so you understand the process, I think you do. Well, I went to many of the meetings. Yeah, I, I just know, can't I do it at 9 o'clock in the morning on I a remember. weekday. I remember. Um, it's, they're not... They're working for the council. It's a council subcommittee. So, you know, that's something, as I said earlier, the council can propose a zoning amendment. Our ordinance requires those come to, come to the planning board for recommendation. It's like the Conservation Commission makes recommendations for us on an actual application. So um, it's not shoving down anybody's throat. Well, I think we've already I get your point. We've right? already illustrated a joint work joint work session with the HDC and the planning was very valuable and it made a consensus and made things a lot easier. So instead of letting them work in a vacuum and then just sell, sending us our work product, I think that could be more efficient and uh, for everybody. Communication is a good thing and the HDC, just so folks know, um, there has been conversation. I've gotten notes from the HDC. They like the idea of the joint meeting that we had, maybe trying to do it on a more regular basis. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. So Agreed. that's something else we can add to our list of things Thank to you, do. Mr. Chair. And with that, I'm going to thank everybody and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Uh -huh.